okay, um, you know, participants are coming into, you know, one by one, it's almost, almost 50, 40, 50. So um, can you hear me, Dr. Yes. Sai? Yes. <laughs> okay, now uh, at least we, we can communicate with each other under this extraordinary situation. And, uh, um, as you, again, um, thank you everyone for joining us in this first first webinar or seminar, online seminar on uh, um, the the um, you know th this is the first first attempt of the four. Um, series of, uh, uh, you know, four, four, four seminars. And uh, this is the first one, a new great game for the Red Sea and the Horn of Africa. Um, in the coming two months, uh, we are planning to hold um, entirely four, four seminars. And, and this is the first one. And the second one is uh, about the East Mediterranean strategic rivalry. And the third one is about the Sub-Sahara and the Sahel region. And the fourth one would be um, superpower rivalry in the cyber and security. Yeah. Um, okay, so, and uh, this uh, seminar series is co-organized by um, ARCAST and the Rhodes uh, ARCAST Open Laboratory for Emergence Strategies and IGSD, uh, 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 Institute of, of Def um, Global Security and Defense Studies in Abu Dhabi, uh, all, uh, headed by Dr. Uh, Said Ghanem. And uh, th today, this is the first one, a new great game for the Red Sea and the Horn of Africa. And we, we, we start with, but um, aside from this topic, we start with a new issue emerging in, in the Gulf area. And the, so first of all, we ask Dr. Said name. Uh, on his, his present, a short presentation about Israeli um, Gulf normalization and also uh, um, uh, reconciliation among GCC country, rival countries like Saudi Arabia and Qatar. So uh, would you start? Yes, sure. Yeah, sure. Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning, other side of the world. So uh, thank you for being with you. Uh, I will not talk much in this, but it's good to start to show from my angle how I see two things, normalization and uh, uh, reconciliation with Qatar. Uh, everybody heard and read about what's going on, but let, please allow me to intervene in this issue from another angle, which may be different angle. I will talk about both of them within four expressions, four terms. First one is formulate a new order. Second one, which is conflict between interests and values. Third one, which is normalization itself. Fourth one, reconciliation. How is he connection or relations among the four? I believe that is to maintain the world order or the regional order, or to reformulate reform the regional order or the world order. So what was going on within the last four years, which was in the period of presidency of Trump, that was changing or reformulating the original order came different, totally, I, I can say different from democratic way. Not only different from democratic to Republican, no, it's further. It's different from American to Trumpian. If I talk about the American site or the American portion, 
which was really too much affecting. And it was a favor of some part of the region. They believe that during Obama, they were suppressed. They were and the marginalized, I can say, or did not achieve whatever they want. When I talk about the conflict between interests and values, we used to see that between ideologies, like, you know, Soviet Union, USA, and so. So USA and West always talking about values. The Eastern side talking about interests more. Inside each country, I mean, from the West especially, there are small, not appearing conflict, but, uh, not appearing uh, 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 the conflict between values and interest inside each country. But what happened within the last four years that it was inside USA, inside Europe, that the conflict between values and interests were very high, very high. So. In, it was more than pragmatist, you know, it was more than pragmatism, I'm sorry. So interests were really high to deal with interest with other countries, which was really very good with that submerging or let me say, uh, you know, this, this is how can I say, emerging, I'm sorry, the emerging countries like the Gulf countries and Israel in the, era, in the era or the time of Trump. Normalization. It's like, to me, it's like Cold War, not in the meaning, but in the position. Cold War is only, or I think it's only between Russia, Soviet Union, and USA. Normalization is only for relation of Israel with others, like Arab or Muslim countries. When we see the relations between Japan and other countries, it's normal. We don't say normalizing Japanese relation with any other country. But when it comes to Israel normalizing, from this, it's something like goal to Israel. It's something maybe created during Nasser's era, the Arab nationalism or so. So it was something like goal. So in this case, if I, if I think that normalization was a goal to Israel, and maybe it was a tool or a card of pressure or card of negotiation of the Gulf countries. Like for example, I believe it's also, it's not goal to the Gulf countries, but it's more tool and like steps for what coming more. And it's also like card of negotiation, like help me to counter the uh, GCPOA, for example, as you want also as Israel, or help me that as United States of America, which is represented in Trumpian way. It was also negotiation card to Sudan to release the sanctions to Morocco, to uh, 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 confess or recognize recognition of Western Sahara, which I worked in 1995-96. So it, it, is, it shaped this way. When it comes to reconciliation, so boycott or besieging, whatever you call it, it was a cut of pressure, okay? Not a goal at all. It was just cut of pressure and the good time, it was during Trump time because it was, as I told you, as I see it, it's Trumpian way. And the boycott, it was, as I told you, cut of pressure, why? Cart of pressure against Iran. Cart of pressure against Turkey. Against Iran because they want Iran to be more isolated. According to, because Iran, Iran relations with Qatar was not that new. It has some before in security wise in the Gulf and securing the gas and the relation in the gas field and so. And the relations between Turkey and Iran, it has been a change. It became pretending as much better under the umbrella of Islam, no Sunni, no Shiite here. Just having one enemy, which is, uh, who is ever against Palestinian cause, like Israel, for example, or other Arabian countries who are in relations with Israel. That's why you can see that the relations with Iran, GCP or A, uh, the normalization itself, how it's also connected to 
boycotting, and then comes to reconciliation. And the Palestinian cause is in the middle. It became also not a goal to solve out. It became like two to all competing countries. Also, re cut, uh, boycotting or besieging, but I believe it's boycotting actually for some reason. So boycotting is also something like for a reason for competition, or it has been used for competition at rivalries, and it will be appearing during our coming three lectures in the Horn of Africa, for example. And now when we look at normalization and reconciliation, if I'm understood, I hope I could bring my points out to you. If we look at the normalization and reconciliation together now, as I told you, it's within interests. No values are here. I don't say lack of values or increase of values, but it's a game of interest among all players. And the main key point here, the Gulf countries would like to be participants of the game in the Middle East and other regions. They were not before. It was always between superpowers or great powers and regional powers like Iran, Turkey, and Israel. So the changing of the game, we see really changed the regional order that the Gulf countries with big money and big goals, they start to participate in this game to join or to participate of formulating or reformulating the regional order. And it was through this, the four expressions which I have mentioned, or the other three, which is using the conflict of between interest, as I said, and uh, values, but press more toward the interest, we are here, who will play with us. This is a game, which was against the main rules of the actual game of competition, of international and true regional powers. And also it was something like to say, remember, that word reconciliation, just to get you back a little bit, for example, please. Reconciliation, it's a word always used in between two parts of the main body, two organs of the main body. There is no reconciliation between two countries, right? So because they believe that the GCC was one body and this reconciliation between two parts of this body, but is really GCC is one body? Was it really one body? So I think it's not reconciliation. I don't think it's reconciliation. It's a temporary solution to keep and maintain one main goal, which I'm ending my short speech now. The main goal of all what's going on right now until the last moment of Trump, and it could be succeeded to make it extended, is that we need to keep the regional order. We have it changed it within the last four years. No way to change it. No way to come back before 2017. No way to the GCPOA, which is one of the main elements to change the regional order with. No way that Israel is not in the true community of the Arab countries. You can notice that when you see, when I was in the United States Central Command, I talked to uh, uh, the, uh, a big head, I don't like to mention his name, in the planning section. And I asked him, when Israel will be within or working with US CENTCOM, not EUROCOM? And he told me, still not yet. This one of, how can I say, notifications that now Israel, because you know, US CENTCOM is what? In Bright Star, we were, we were just training with the uh, United States, uh, United States, it was with US CENTCOM and other allies. So Israel maybe will be in the, this kind of military maneuvers with Arab countries. And this is the new regional order, which all the current winning or strong part in the region would like to keep and not to change. This is how I see all of them, but maybe in different angles. Thank you. Thank you very much, Said. And uh, so this is a um, not not the main part of this tomorrow's uh, seminar. But uh, is there any? But it, it's a very hot issue. And it, it, 
is there anyone um, just um, want to say something on it? Um, maybe Mark and Eric or anyone? It's okay. I think Professor Sayed mm -hmm. took us already very far mm -hmm. and very high. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, if I may, if I may, it's just food for thought. Yeah, please, please, Eric. Eric. Yeah, so sorry, to, this best to show, I, I can just be uh, fully, uh, I can just uh, fully agree with this of what uh, Dr. Sayed told us. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, this is what's happening. It's about uh, the, the former order and to keep it to the third against uh, Iran. I would just to desert, emphasize this, uh, something that he mentioned uh, about the reconciliation. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I, I, I agree. It's not about reconciliation. Because, um, um, firstly, about uh, the DCC mm. unity now, this, uh, um, if you are looking at this uh, to the deal that this, uh, they concluded this, uh, on the 5th of January, um, there were normally this, uh, uh, 13 points to meet by Qatar before this, uh, being uh, again member, full member of the DCC. And uh, Qatar didn't comply with any one of the 13 points, mm -hmm. any one. And one quick, big question that we still have is what was the deal behind to get this uh, such obligation? We don't know what was uh, the, the deal. Uh, we, some, some people are thinking that it is what's about uh, uh, please, uh, to please the Biden administration. I don't believe it because uh, um, uh, Jared Kushner worked to this on very oddly, and it's not to do so for to please uh, Biden. Uh, it's one thing. Uh, secondly, about uh, the acceptance from the uh, UAE. Yes, I'm living in the UAE, so this, uh, I'm, I have this, uh, this angle. Um, so you see that Sir Abu Dhabi is not very this deal. It's uh, since uh, the deal, uh, so you have uh, the, the big leaders of Abu Dhabi just uh, saying nothing about the deal. So do you don't have uh, any any points coming from uh, some new Abu bin Zayed. We have nothing coming from uh, Abdullah bin, uh, bin Zayed. So the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, nothing about uh, so these points. Uh, only uh, it came only by the Sir Garkach just to do to mention the positive things. And after this, you have Dubai. Dubai is very pleased because, of, this, of course, it's uh, aiming about the uh, interest, economic interest. So Dubai can be pleased, but definitively Abu Dhabi is not. And so um, about GCC reconciliation, we, we still need to, to have more details to know what will be the next step because we have a, a, a a lot of question marks about. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. And uh, okay, we move on to the the main part of today's seminar. It's a it's about new great game for the Red Sea and the Horn of Africa. So um, first of all, we ask we request um, Professor Mark Laverne on the broad uh, introduction of this area, um, Red Sea and uh, uh, Horn of Africa, and particularly from the side of African side. And we have now a mutually compl complementary, you know, presentation expert and from the Arab side, Gulf side, and the European side, and um, Professor Laverne. So uh, would you um, 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 make a presentation to us about the African side, mainly African side of this um, very important uh, region, um, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, I was tasked to, to present the general frame of the situation around the Red Sea, but I, I choose to emphasize on the Horn of Africa, which I know for roughly, uh, no, exactly 50 years now, uh, I, I kept visits that uh, went along uh, this long period. 
So uh, I think this is an area which is not so well known. Uh, and um, uh, to me, geopolitics is uh, more than international relations. It also uh, takes its roots within the societies yeah. and within the, the milieu that is the natural framing of uh, the areas and the, the Red Sea and the Horn of Africa are very special and uh, not so well known. So many things are happening uh, at, the, at the moment in this part of the world, which uh, are difficult to understand from an uh, external point of view. So I was tasked to present briefly the fundamentals of the situation in this area. Um, the, the Red Sea definitely, I don't know if you can see the PowerPoint or should I try to activate oh, yes. it? Uh, would you share with us? You, you get it? Okay, fine. No, 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 yeah. no not yet. Oh. Not yet? You don't see it, I don't know how to. Share screen, share screen. Green one. The green one, okay. Okay. Share screen, yeah. Yeah. Uh, need to be back. No. Um, well, 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 here you are. Here we are. Mm. No, I lost. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you have to open your presentation first. And then share screen. I'm not yes. Sure. Uh huh. Oh hey, yeah. Wait. Okay, I'm back. Now, screen. Yeah, here we are. Do you see it now? Yes. Or not yet? Yes? Yes, yes you got it? OK, fine. So open it, and open it, uh, full screen, I think you have. Full screen, OK, yeah. Possibly. How is it? You get it full screen? Okay, just maybe you can continue if mm, Satoshi okay. doesn't mind okay. yes. this way. Yeah. Okay, first of all, the, the Red Sea has been since the dawn of mankind, kind of a corridor of trade between uh, Europe and the Far East somehow, and uh, um, through the Mediterranean and the Indian Ocean. Um, it has been also uh, crossing between Africa and Asia. Uh, just remember the, the time of Moses when he crossed the Red Sea with his people to escape uh, the Pharaoh. Um, the Red Sea is a kind of Mediterranean Sea, in fact, because the civilization around the Red Sea is uh, broadly the same, be it on one side or another. It's a uh, uh, so even more than the Mediterranean that we know in Europe, it's not a border between Africa and Asia. It's a link between uh, these uh, two uh, areas. And the, the Red Sea is a fault line uh, in terms of geology, which is separating and it's very deeply uh, entrenched between Asia and Africa. But the, the people on the seashores, they share the same life, the same custom, the same um, interest. Those who are behind in the mountains, be it in Yemen or even Ethiopia, they are very different. So what is the major feature of this area is this difference between the seashores with nomads, herders, seamen, people who are open to the world, who are traveling, who, are, who don't accept um, uh, strong powers. They feel very independent. And from Somalia, to, uh, to Sudan or uh, Arabia, uh, th the same difference uh, is to be noticed between the highlands behind and the seashores. Um, the highlands are very 
uh, remote, uh, closed worlds that are fearing the aggression from the outside. And there are very stable civilizations with kingdoms, uh, sometimes um, uh, be it uh, again in Yemen or in Ethiopia for ages. So <clears throat> now new states have been built after the opening of the Suez Canal, the um, colonial, colonial powers took root on the seashores because they needed harbors. But they didn't too much uh, enter the highlands because they were not able to and they had no interest in that. So um, France, Great Britain, Italy took colonies along the shores and this um, increase the difference between the uh, seashores and the hinterland. <clears throat> the hinterland kept with their traditional uh, masters, busy being the emperor of Ethiopia or in Yemen, the, the, the people who are um, around the, the, the imam who was running the country. So these, um, these countries are somehow twofold. And there are, uh, first of all, this uh, uh, rift between these two uh, sides. Uh, on the hinterland, strong kingdoms, but very conservative and not open to the world. And on the seashore, people who are moving uh, freely from one side to another. Uh, for instance, I, I remember a friend of mine in, in Asmara, in Eritrea, he had three, four women, one in each of those harbors. He was from Saudi, from Jeddah, but he had a wife in Sudan, another in Hodeida in Yemen, and another in Massawa uh, in, um, in Eritrea. And this is a quite a, a common um, feature of the societies in this part of the world. These people move around and they have linked, uh, for instance, if we uh, come back to Ethiopia, uh, the, the billionaire, Mr. Mohamed El Amoudi, he is uh, one of the richest men in the world. And he is both Ethiopian and Saudi. That is, he lives in Jeddah, but he is uh, Ethiopian by birth and nationality, or he has the, both nationalities. And his interest, his view of the world is constructed around the Red Sea, and uh, this is from, from, from that part of the, of the world that he developed his activities all around. Uh, people are moving so, and uh, they have the flexibility in language and in, uh, in tradition. Um, on, the, on the highlands, it's quite different. I mean, people are not so, so flexible in their mind. Um, they are, uh, they keep close to their ancient religion, be it Christianity in Ethiopia, which was Christian much before Europe, uh, the fourth century. And on the other hand, Yemen has this uh, uh, special understanding of Islam with the Zaidi uh, sect that is now represented by the Houthi uh, fighters. Uh, another element that uh, should be recalled is that the Red Sea is not a closed world since um, when you look at it in the Arab League, you also integrate Djibouti, Somalia, and even the Comoros Islands on the e Indian Ocean. That is, there is no uh, such a thing as a Arab world, so to say, but also a larger world that integrates some other dimensions which uh, are rooted deep in history up to Madagascar, to the south of the Indian Ocean. This is something that is uh, um, now um, renewed, revived with the Daesh intervention in Mozambique, in Cabo Delgado, which is a very devastating enterprise by Daesh to counter the exploitation of, uh, of gas and uh, to, to use the, the poverty of the population far uh, from, from its roots in the Arabic Peninsula or in the Middle East, but still 
in this part of the world, you can feel in Zanzibar also that you belong to something as an extension of the Red Sea. <clears throat> so um, the, the colonial powers built new states, states like uh, Somalia, for instance, or Djibouti, or um, Eritrea. These states were along colonial borders, but they integrate the difference that is um, together the seashores and the highlands. So these countries have all a difficulty to create a nation, to build a state. They are very unstable. And uh, when you look at it, there are uh, strong trends to secession, to separation. And the central states have a lot of difficulties to impose their rules themselves, uh, be it from the central highland, like Sana'a in Yemen, for instance, or like Addis Abeba, the new uh, flower, which was built only 150 years ago to, to control this vast territory of Ethiopia. Uh, these uh, uh, centers, and the same goes for Magadisho, which was the Italian capital of Somalia. They are in a, in a tremendous difficulty to unite the people and the tribes that are gathered within their territory because these lands are um, divided through uh, tribes, clans, confederations, and not only um, by this uh, split that I mentioned between the seashores and the hinterland. Even in the hinterland, even uh, in the, on the seashores, there are strong divides between the people that don't feel to have much in common. Look, for instance, as this uh, picture of Ethiopia, uh, there are the about 80 Mark, people. Yes. Uh, press on the slide because uh, we need to get okay. the big slide. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. The main slide, yeah. I'm a beginner on that. Yeah. So, <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, we missed the previous slide then, but you all know the general overview of the area. Uh, now, uh, yeah. So 80 uh, peoples in Ethiopia. You can see on this uh, slide the uh, strong divide between the Muslim communities that are in green and the Christian communities in blue. This is also a major divide in a country like Ethiopia or even in uh, in uh, Eritrea, but we could say the same about Yemen between the Zaidi and the Shafi'i on the coast. Uh, within the Islam, there are also strong divides within these communities. What I show in Somalia, um, not, not to go too much into the, this problem of Somalia, but there is a, really an imbroglio with different clans overlapping and fighting each other and refusing uh, to unite within one country. Let's now move to Sudan because Sudan has also a window to the Red Sea. Sudan is a huge country. It used to be the giant of Africa and it's now divided also uh, between North and South. What I would emphasize there, it's, a, it's of course a huge country with a, with a lot of diversity in climate from the desert to the rainforest, from the North to the South on 3000 kilometers. Uh, but it's a vast plain there. There's no problem between the seashore and the mainland. It's all mainland and it's a huge, huge um, space where people move freely. And there are also hundreds of uh, communities, different communities living there, not only in the south, but also in the north. And the, the south fought for 50 years to uh, be recognized by the center, by Khartoum. I was a, a friend and a colleague to the, uh, the one uh, who became the leader of the rebellion of the, the South, the uh, Sudan People's Liberation Movement. Um, the, the name itself of this movement 
shows that the southerners, they didn't fight for separation, for secession. They fought for the equality of rights within the United Sudan. And they at least, at last, obtained independence uh, in uh, 2011. But they kept the name Sudan. They considered themselves as Sudanese as much as the people of the Northern Sudan. And uh, it shows that uh, behind this diversity, there is, a, uh, at least in the case of Sudan, on the contrary, a will to keep close and still now Southern Sudan doesn't feel foreign to Northern Sudan and plays a role in the um, trial to, to settle the internal problems uh, within uh, Northern Sudan. As we uh, well know, and even those days, there are still very hot problems in Darfur, in the Nuba Mountains, on the Red Sea, and in various parts of Sudan. And what is at stake now is uh, not so much the unity of the country, but the equality between the center, the central regions, which are Arabized and Islamized, and uh, the peripheries who feel marginalized and frustrated. The same somehow could, uh, could be said about Southern Sudan, where the independence was uh, taken by a, a bunch of officers that are now ruling the country very ruthlessly without taking care of the diversity of the population and the needs of this population of Southern Sudan. So uh, this uh, gives scopes to many uh, developments all around the Red Sea and in the Horn of Africa that are not right now for solution. And uh, uh, it seems it's doubtful that the um, foreign powers, be it the powers from the Arabic Peninsula, be it the international community, will be able to solve, to help solving these problems of unity in diversity, be it in the Horn of Africa or be it in Sudan itself. And the, the situation is uh, the more uh, dramatic that these countries have from the poorest in the world and that they need foremost development and the development trials in Ethiopia we for instance the, the great renaissance uh, dam as we see have also risen a lot of uh, confrontation with neighboring powers neighboring countries so now the horn of Africa is also split and you see some alliances which are very volatile between Kenya entering uh, the enlarging somehow uh, the Horn of Africa by being interested in exploiting um, offshore um, petroleum oil fields at the border with Somalia. So internal um, rifts uh, are still uh, to forecast, unfortunately, in the Horn of Africa and, uh, and uh, maybe in Sudan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark, for, for your uh, presentation on, on um, African side, uh, domestic and uh, regional issues. And before before moving on to um, uh, Eric's presentation, can, can I just um, um, ask you, you know, uh, um, Mark, um, ask you a small question? It's about Sudan. You know, Sudan is part of Horn of Africa, or, or you know, wider Horn of Africa region. But it's of course it's in the Nile Valley country, and now there's a of course there, there's a um, conflict between um, um, Egypt and Ethiopia. But uh, Sudan, um, um, uh, traditionally, of course, it's an Arab country and uh, separated, seceded. Uh, south part and now south, southern part is seceded. So northern part of Sudan is Arab country, but um, it, it's it's some there, there's some you know, there's something curious about it. And now that um, you know Sudan's position is not always Arab from my point of view. So, uh, but uh, you're expert on this region. What what what's your you know? understanding of Sudan's position between Ethiopia and Egypt. Is there any, you know, <laughs> any peculiarity in it? 
Yeah, that, this is a very interesting point because, mm. in fact, uh, you're you're fully right. The the Sudanese they they didn't solve this question, uh, which is a wrong question in my opinion. Uh, if um, of, of whether they are Africans or Arabs, mm. they are both, and uh, there is no solution to that. Um, there, it's very strange to to notice. I lived for for many many years in Sudan uh, for over ten years uh, at a row. And so I could discuss this with many uh, leaders and with the, the local population. They, they all Sudanese, they, they have a strong feeling of being Sudanese. That's mm -hmm. what I, I mentioned before. But Sudanese feel closer to Ethiopians, mm -hmm. to Somalians mm -hmm. in their way of life, in their values, in their, not the religion, not the, uh, the language, but the, the, con the, the individual uh, behavior mm -hmm. and the values of music, food, mm -hmm. and all what matters really in the relationship between peoples, they are much closer to the Horn of Africa mm -hmm. than to Egypt, for instance. And they feel when they go abroad, uh, that is in the Arabic Peninsula, as uh, workers, for instance, mm -hmm. that they are not considered as Arabs. Oh. So this also reflects in their, their own sense of belonging mm -hmm. to the Horn of Africa more than to the Arab world. They always feel very careful. For instance, the, uh, we were talking about the um, recognition of Israel. I, I really doubt that the, the Sudanese people feel very much concerned with this uh, Palestinian question. They are more looking now to Western Africa uh, for some part or to the, to the South, even to South and Sudan, they feel uh, more involved in the problems of the Great Lakes, of the Chad Basin, of the Sahel altogether. One should not forget that the Islam even, despite Sudan is very close to Saudi Arabia and to, the, um, to, to Mecca, mm -hmm. uh, it was Islamized by pilgrims that came all over by foot from Senegal, from Mauritania, from the Maghreb, mm -hmm. you know, and they settled in the uh, Sudanese villages and they, they took root there and they brought Islam, which is a very different Islam uh, mm -hmm. with the, the Turok, this is the brotherhood mm -hmm. from the Egyptian Islam, for instance, which is based on, on the, the literature mm -hmm. and the literacy and the, the, the discussion uh, through Al-Azhar University, of course. Uh, they are they are very special, a special case. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then um, somehow the Arab world is something that they, they, they benefit from, but they, they, they feel very different. And in fact, they, they feel it's a, such a huge country that they don't look too much outside and mm -hmm. more to inside. Thank you very much. So now we move on to our next presentation by um, Eric Mich Michel. Uh, is it okay, my pronunciation of your name? So, uh, perfect, perfect. <laughs> Sorry, my poor pronunciation, but then um, it's about um, international rivalry in Horn of Africa and the Red Sea. Um, so um, so we, we would pretty much uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, like to hear Europeans' view uh, uh, on this issue. So, um, so please, Eric. Yes, thank you, thank you. So about my name, you know, you are not the only one. I think that it's only my country that they can pronounce uh, the name. So, so I don't care about it. <laughs> so, not an issue, and it's uh, just uh, uh, something that it is. I used to. Um, I'm gonna try to to share my screen. Uh, yeah, it's just to to be sure that the user I get uh, uh, this one. Do you see it? Are you getting the user the my screen? Yes. Yes. It yes. Perfect. It's perfect. So you have my presentation. So yes. So uh, you, you speak about uh, inter international uh, rivalries. Uh, I would say it's uh, maybe only about the, the Greek powers because uh, uh, international, it means uh, with every country. And uh, uh, Dr. Sayet will address uh, with uh, the more regional powers. So we, we divide it at the presentation 
into two parts, and I will just focus on uh, the grid powers in the Red Sea. And um, yes, of course, um, the first, this is the outlines of uh, my presentation. And uh, I will firstly uh, consider this about the uh, chapters uh, I will speak about, because uh, when we speak about international actors, we have a lot. And uh, um, Secondly, this I will say, okay, what is so important in uh, the own Africa, of Africa, or in the Red Sea region for these international actors? And uh, last point I will address you, it's uh, how they exert uh, the influence the, in the region. So uh, a short brief this about uh, that. Um, yes, about uh, these international actors, of course, this, uh, we have what I consider the, the, the three main global powers in the world. So we have, of course, the United States, uh, we have China, the two competing for the first rank. Uh, of course, it's about the military power, economic power, influence power, and so on. But we cannot ignore also Russia. Russia is maybe not uh, as, and looks, not so as powerful like the, uh, the two other sides. But don't forget that uh, Russia still has a, a great military power from my side. It's uh, a very influential power and has also this a, a big uh, about territory. So we have to consider because it is, uh, Russia is trying to influence anything and also counter US, to counter US and to be also sometimes uh, outside of China. And you can imagine that this, uh, for a European guy, this, uh, I would like to address also Europe. Uh, do I have to address? This, uh, uh, if we see Europe, uh, Europe is an economical power. So uh, uh, we, we have a, a lot of exchange. Of course, uh, we also, we have uh, some military meaning because uh, inside Europe, if we take the uh, UK, the uh, United Kingdom, is it, uh, we have two nuclear power. We have uh, two, uh, two countries having uh, this, uh, the veto right at the UN, uh, uh, UN Security uh, Council. Um, so if we are counting the number of soldiers we have in Europe, it amounts so. But if, I have to be honest. Uh, Europe, it's just a desert time, uh, lacks uh, of unity when it's about uh, foreign policy. Um, Europe has some difficulties to, uh, to have uh, one voice uh, for any trouble. And it's sometimes competing internally about uh, uh, what is the stand they have to adapt to places uh, any problem, any issue in the world. So, uh, on that way, yes, um, Europe, it's not always this, uh, uh, a great power so for, for international issues. But it's a good point of comparison when we are just addressing some points, uh, when we are discussing about US, uh, uh, Russia, and uh, China, just, uh, we can compare sometimes uh, some points with Europe. Uh, yes, is it the same? But um, during this presentation, just to make this, um, uh, some comparison points, I will just address two main countries, not as global power, but just as comparison points. It's about UK and France. Why this, uh, these two countries? It's because, like uh, I just mentioned, uh, France and UK are, are two nuclear powers. Uh, have veto rights and have a, a colonial past in uh, in uh, Africa in, in the region. So they, they have they exerted so, uh, some kind of influence. So it will be very interesting to compare uh, the very big powers to this two one. Um, yeah. So what makes the own Africa is very important for for them. Um, uh, I will maybe dis uh, disappoint uh, Mark uh, because uh, my believing when uh, when this, I, I'm analyzing the, the three main powers that they, they don't have so 
a certain interest in, in, in the country, in the nations uh, ashore uh, the risk. Uh, it's not about the population and so on. It's about, like the sir, uh, Dr. Syed uh, mentioned at the beginning of the conference, about interest, interest and interest. So we have the Red Sea. Uh, the Red Sea is firstly the uh, connectional routes uh, uh, between Asia and, and, and Europe. And also the rest of the it's connecting the world. Uh, don't forget that there about 10% of uh, the international trade it's this the rates. Um, I've heard this a lot of uh, figures about this, uh, the international trade. So this, uh, sometimes uh, some people are saying that it's about 20%, 30%, but the, the, the figures I have is 10%, it's already a lot. Uh, but also the 30% of the oil. It's uh, yes. So yes, it's uh, firstly this are uh, a very uh, a very big uh, uh, waterway for the international trade, and of course we have two choke points uh, on uh, closing of the, uh, the the Red Sea. We have uh, of course uh, the Canal of Suez and also the Strait of Babel Mante, the two one. Uh, I, I like the, in, in red. Um, so it's a very, uh, very strange uh, fact, very important to know because, this, uh, for example, for Suez Canal, it was already closed uh, twice in the past. It was closed in uh, uh, 56 and also uh, during the period uh, from, uh, uh, um, from 67 to uh, 75. So to, to, to main uh, period where this, uh, it was not possible to uh, uh, to cross uh, the uh, canal of Suez. So very, very important. Um, uh, it's, and it's, so for the three major uh, powers, they needed to, to keep it open. Uh, what we have also, it's uh, the Yemen war. So Yemen war, it's uh, about security. Um, you, you know that it's uh, we, we are facing in uh, the Red Sea some security issue coming into from Yemen. So we have, uh, for example, uh, at different times, this, uh, the last two years, so this uh, incident with uh, uh, missiles fired by a uh, uh, party against uh, the uh, commercial tankers. We have also sea mines and we have also the waterborne uh, improvised explosive device. Which is like uh, 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 water, uh, uh, navy drones uh, uh, loaded, uh, laden with uh, this explosive and uh, aiming to destroy any uh, vessels. Um, if uh, we we have also this Iran, Iran, and this, it's a major concern for for US. And um, if you see the Red Sea, of course we have uh, Iran being involved or. It, allegedly involved in Yemen, uh, supporting uh, supporting the Houthis. But we have also uh, a huge task force from the Iranian Navy always being present in, uh, in uh, very close to the Strait of Bab el Mandeb task force. The carrier task force like the reserve we have in the uh, for the moment in uh, the year. Uh, Aramian uh, uh, Sea uh, with the Nimitz. And this, uh, everybody knows the Nimitz and uh, the carrier group with uh, some frigates, destroyer, and uh, and support ships. We have the same from uh, from Iran. And uh, very very particular that it is uh, the presence of Iranian navy in the Strait of uh, Bab el It's permanent. It's permanent. There is no no gap. Sometimes yes, one or two days, but no more. So. Very important about uh, terrorism. Terrorism this is a very uh, big concern for uh, the major power. Um, yes and no. They are more concerned about piracy, piracy in uh, uh, in the Red Sea and uh, about this at the shore of uh, Somalia. So it's uh, something that the desert it's uh, uh, very important to, to know that it's more about piracy than the terrorism. Um, one thing that very important to understand also that it's a, for Russia, uh, the Red Sea, it's uh, the 
secondary exit from uh, the Mediterranean Sea and are from this uh, strategic uh, point of view, very important. I want also to, to address something that uh, not, uh, not everybody knows about uh, the uh, submarine cables. Because, uh, we, are at the, uh, we are living in, this, in the 21st century and it's about communication. Communication is uh, paramount now. Uh, it's not only this or for the, the social media, but it's, it's about the uh, uh, finance. It's uh, connecting the uh, the stock exchange between uh, uh, London, Paris, uh, Tokyo, and uh, and uh, Beijing. So it's very important. And if you see the world communication cables, so there's a lot are passing uh, underway of the Red Sea. Uh, of the Red Sea, so very important on, on, on that way. Um, um, normally, it's uh, always built by the uh, international companies, but you can see that the, the China uh, also laid down the, the, its cable in the, the Red Sea to be more independent for uh, uh, for the communication. And what I am showing you also on my slide, it's. Uh, uh, the network uh, of the national security agency, the US one, having uh, some uh, some stations in a, in the Middle East, and one it's a place that is in Djibouti to to be able to to communication and to to be able to, to intercept communication on, on on the cables, and we have also to go the stations on uh, in in the Persian Arab Persian Gulf. So yes. The, it's it's very important that you do that because communication it's now this are one of the main aspects of the world. Yes, how do they exert the influence? Firstly, it's about ensuring uh, security. Um, we have a lot of international uh, operation in uh, in the region. Most of the operation, operation that, that is highlighted is in red are coming at the, uh, I led by the US. Uh, it's led by the US, but you have a lot of, uh, of um, um, international cooperation, not only US that you have. In the CTF 151, that is, uh, it's uh, controlling uh, the Bab and Mandeb in the Gulf of Aden, uh, we have this. Uh, uh, other countries coming at this from uh, Saudi Arabia, but also UAE and so on. So it's not only um, only uh, uh, US. We have also uh, the European Union uh, being involved with uh, the operation Atalanta. But it's more this, uh, against uh, against piracy um, in, uh, in this. Uh, NATO was uh, involved in uh, in the region. But they seized the operation. Uh, it was uh, the Ocean Shield operation. Uh, they, they stopped this. Uh, they seized the this operation in 2016. So there is no NATO operation currently uh, at sea in, in the region. What is the also very important when we are uh, speaking about security and uh, military presence? It's about um, Dr. Sayed already mentioned that. We have a lot of ports in, uh, in the region, mainly on the uh, western uh, shore of uh, the, the Red Sea. In Egypt, we have already 20 different ports. 20, it's a lot. After we have this, uh, a few in Sudan, uh, and we have, of course, the, the main uh, port of Djibouti because it's very uh, strategic uh, uh, located. Um, and from uh, Saudi Arabia, this, uh, we have this, uh, only six uh, six uh, main ports. And if you compare this uh, six main port and uh, on the the distance, the the, uh, the range, this, uh, the, uh, the number of kilometers of shores, and you compare it to to, to Egypt, a, a, a huge difference. You have to to know that in Saudi Arabia. Uh, 50% of the ports are owned or operated by UAE, not that they are only by uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, we have only two main ports of uh, military interest. It's uh, uh, Port Sudan, where we have now this uh, 
uh, Russia and uh, Turkey, and we have Djibouti, with a lot of uh, of uh, countries sharing this, uh, sometimes uh, some facility where we, being very close to, to each other. So we have, uh, for example, the big place Le Monnier from the US hosting also the UK presents. Um, we have uh, also France, Italy, uh, Jap um, Japan is uh, also uh, present uh, there. So a lot of countries are present in, this, uh, in Djibouti. And uh, of course, it's about the security. But it's, Djibouti is now overcrowded. And uh, you can assume that it's, uh, you can have uh, some, uh, uh, some conflict. So we have some incidents between uh, these uh, Chinese soldiers and uh, this US. For example, um, China, uh, Chinese soldiers using laser against uh, uh, the aircraft from the US. And so making some incidents. Um, what is very important to, to notice is that uh, sir, for China, um, that, uh, uh, that base it is in Djibouti, it's what I would call the, the most chief action from uh, Xi Jinping, because having a, a, a base abroad, it's something very, very new, I would say. Um, yes, uh, what we have, it's a military cooperation agreement. Of course, you to have a base, so you, have a, uh, you need to have a military uh, cooperation agreement. And I highlighted that so recently, uh, Russia concludes 21 different cooperation agreements in, uh, in, uh, in Africa, just recently. Uh, and three are in the region with Egypt, Sudan, and Ethiopia. It's uh, what I highlighted to this, uh, with uh, the uh, yellow stars. Yes, three in the region, it's uh, something like this. Um, about economic, uh, yes, economic, uh, we, we can say this a lot. So firstly, uh, about sanctions, uh, it's mainly this uh, from uh, US. US is using uh, sir, sanctions tools to, uh, uh, to make some pressure and to get uh, what he wants. But uh, currently, uh, there is no, no sanctions against uh, these uh, countries uh, in the Horn Africa. So the last one was against uh, Sudan, and it was revoked in uh, 2017. But US still threats uh, the, the, the country about uh, this, uh, sanctions. It's like the uh, US was uh, threatening uh, Egypt uh, with sanctions about uh, the uh, uh, weapon sales uh, from, uh, from Russia to Egypt. About financial uh, flow, very important. Everybody thinks that, that uh, um, uh, China is uh, the most important investor in, in, uh, in Africa. But uh, China is owning debt. It's just its mortgage. That it's, uh, it's not investment. In, but investment, direct investment, what is very interesting for any countries, it's not the, the champion. You, you see that the, the UF and the US, UK, France, and China, it's only the, the fourth. We don't see uh, this uh, Russia about investment. But it's very important to make a, a, a big difference between money flow and, um, and investment, direct investment. Um, about import and export. If you look at this at uh, Africa, I'm sorry because uh, the, the countries are in, in French because I could not translate it uh, on time. Um, but if you see about uh, uh, the commercial uh, balance uh, with uh, China, um, everybody thinks that this, uh, it's, uh, uh, China is uh, doing very well with this in, uh, in, uh, in Africa, but China is exporting a lot to Africa, but it's not buying product from Africa. So it's, it's just this 10% that it's buying. The main, uh, the main uh, destination of uh, African products is Europe. So for European countries, it's very important to have a, a very good uh, uh, balance, economical balance, and it's not with China. So China, it's maybe a very big player, economical player, but uh, we have to, to, be, uh, to be very precautionist about what we are.
Um, technology, technology is very important, and this is what uh, uh, I addressed to the uh, the, uh, the concern about the submarine cables. But also, uh, one challenging point now and competing point is about the 5G mobile communication with Huawei, for example. And so we have uh, some deals uh, being done. So um, US is preventing Huawei to to. Uh, to Deploy satellites in 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 US in Europe and so on. But this, uh, uh, Huawei it's a very uh, assertive in uh, in Saudi in in UAE, but also uh, in Egypt uh, to, to be able to uh, to deploy its technology. And uh, of course, it's a strategic alliance. Uh, what is uh, the advantage of uh, China? It's to be able to to deploy very quickly and very. Cheap. About diplomatic and politics, of course, uh, I, I spoke about the sanction, economical sanction, but also we have to, to think about the pressure. It's like it's, uh, the pressure exerted by US to, to have a Sudan signing uh, the Abraham uh, Agreement. It was a deal about uh, if you sign, I will remove you from the list of uh, uh, country uh, financing terrorism. One very good tool used by Russia is about veto. Veto. If we are looking at the third uh, in the history, the 15 last years, only the 15 last years, uh, there, there were this uh, 35 veto it at the, the United Nations Security uh, Council. 30, 30, 35. And Russia put uh, its veto 24 times. Um, for um, uh, for this uh, U.S., it was only six times. This just uh, and for China, it was thirty times. Okay, it makes more. But China always uh, put its veto on it together with Russia, never alone, never alone. Uh, and if you are studying the uh, the long history uh, since uh, the uh, forty six. China just put the supplies uh, two times a veto uh, alone, but normally it's just following Russia. Military cooperation, yes, uh, I spoke about the desert, uh, Russia. Uh, it's, it, it's, a tool. it's a tool to make a strategic uh, alliance. Arms sales, sales. Here, this, uh, I, I address you this, uh, this, uh, the, the figures about uh, arms sales. And of course, one of the biggest uh, uh, arm sales, uh, arm seller is Russia. Um, Russia counts for 49% of the sales, weapon sales in, uh, in Africa. And here, this are, uh, I have this are some figures in, uh, below this are about this are the, the millions of dollars uh, trades on Africa and Saudi Arabia. And I make a, a big difference between both because we, we can see that the influence is not the same. It's not the same. We see that the uh, Russia is a champion in the Horn of Africa, and we have US and UK champion in Saudi Arabia. So uh, I don't speak about him. Um, but this is very important, and you see that it's, uh, um, China it's not so uh, so present about the selling weapons. Uh, no, and comparing to France or e even to UK, they're very very small. So, so it's not a it's a uh, weapon the difference. Um, yes, here it is about uh, uh, Russian arms. You see that it's. Uh, uh, it's very important in the Horn of Africa, but you see that it's very, very important uh, in all the Africa. About cultural and information, uh, from an information, yes, we have uh, um, the colonies, uh, mainly UK influence and UK languages. Uh, but I think that sometimes it can be uh, 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 something very good, a good value, added value. But sometimes it can uh, play against you, like it was uh, uh, in Egypt. I think that it's sometimes the English influence it's not uh, always uh, perceived by uh, uh, Egyptian. Um, yes, um, education. Education. It's uh, uh, something very, uh, very important. So uh, 
And you see that there's a, I, I, there's a ranking of the most interesting countries so for, uh, for studying. The, and of course, we see that the United States, United Kingdom, and so on, China. But we have to be very precautious because it's a global, uh, global figures. So if you see where, where are they coming from, yes, it's not always coming from the, uh, uh, the, the region. If you see Russia, it's good ranking, but all the people coming into the force, studying industry in Russia, are from neighboring countries mainly. And if we are looking at this uh, to, uh, uh, to the uh, uh, particular region in Africa, we have this, uh, the, 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 the figures uh, till this, uh, 2014, and after I put this, uh, the figures uh, for uh, 2018. The, the, the last we have, and of course it's double in uh, in France, but you see that the China in red with their uh, um, eighty one thousand students is just increasing a lot. It's attracting more and more students in China because of the policy to offer everything, so it's very cheap. So um, yes, it, China is doing very uh, very good. Um, yes, about uh, cultural institutions, um, it's a ranking, it's about the, um, yes, museum, uh, schools, uh, and, and so on, all in uh, cultural institutes in Africa. And you see that France is uh, uh, for, it's the best one, it's the best one. But China, um, China, you see there's a, a small amount, but um, now it's, uh, almost at the same level of US. It's just increasing, increasing, increasing. And if we see that it is a, the past two years, they opened at least five institutes in the whole of Africa. About medias, medias are also two, um, two things very important to, to mention because we, we know CNN, we know BBC, we know everything about this. Uh, um, about uh, the U.S. Uh, media, but uh, also China uh, tried to, to be very present and opened uh, recently uh, in Kenya uh, an African uh, an African uh, um, channel uh, CGTN. So it looks like it's an African uh, uh, media, but it's hundred percent owned by uh, by uh, Beijing. It's uh, just about to do. Uh, spreading this, its propaganda. Um, you have to know that uh, it's about uh, 150 uh, journalists being uh, present in uh, the, uh, this uh, media. And uh, it's very important to assert that uh, yearly China is forming, it's educating thousand African journalists. So journalists, thousand journalists are educated in China and going back to uh, uh, to Africa, thousand African. Um, also about uh, about uh, Russia, Russia with uh, Russia Today. Russia Today, it's one of the most famous uh, channel. You can see it everywhere. Uh, you have uh, a local anchorage in, in Europe, in France and so on. And they are starting to also be to have a local anchorage in um, in Africa, having that it's also Arabic version, uh, you can find that Russia today in all languages. Very, very important. Yeah, so my partial conclusion. Um, yeah, uh, like I said, um, it's all about interest. And um, on Africa and Red Sea, it's uh, from my perspective, not the top priority of uh, the three. Uh, major powers. It's not. It's just to achieve major priority of the top power. For the US, the, the main priority is to, to, to confront the, the US competitors, mainly China. It's the first. And they will do also by being present in the own Africa, in the Middle East. And after that, it's about the securing uh, securing uh, the uh, national interest. Uh, for China, uh, of course, the region, it's about uh, supporting the Chinese-led Belt and Road Initiative. 
and so they have to do that. And for Russia, uh, the interest in the region, I would say it's uh, pretty new and it's about, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, just uh, continuing its strategy in the Eastern Mediterranean. Because for Russia, the main, the main, uh, the main priority is uh, the Eastern Mediterranean. And of course, because the uh, Red Sea is connected to the Eastern Mediterranean, they, they want to be present and they are just going on now. It's a very recent. Of course, it's a way of sorts to be uh, a stone in the truth of uh, the US. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Eric. And uh, we, we talk about your presentation a lot, but uh, we, we, we have another presentation oh. by Sai. So, and uh, you, uh, Eric, you will make um, first response to Sai's presentation after him. So, um, Dr. Said, would you um, start your presentation about regional perspective on the uh, uh, rivalry in, in the Red Sea and Fonda Africa? So you share the PowerPoint. Uh, as you know, I have shared or make it downloadable uh, all three PowerPoint presentations. Um, I, I uploaded the last one by Dr. Said, so uh, you can see it on, on the screen and also you can download it. So please. So is it clear in front of you now, please? Yes, it, that's okay. great. Okay. So uh, uh, thank you very much again. So I'm lucky to speak twice. <laughs> uh, I, I wanted to say first before I talk, really, I would like to thank you, Satoshi, for something. The selection of the three topics are really too much related. They are surrounding Al Jazeera and Sham, surrounding the Middle East, and they are too much related. And that's why, well, as you notice from my colleagues, that when they were talking, that they touched a little bit, you know, East Mediterranean, the Middle East, so they are all connected. I will try to talk very briefly because I would like to give opportunity to uh, Eric to give some comments, as really is too much specialist in the region, mm. as he's defense attache for the six Gulf countries, in addition to Iran and Yemen. So maybe he can fulfill more. That's why I will talk very quickly, if you don't mind. And I will not mention all of the things, but you can find in my paper, mm -hmm. you can find everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, this is what I will talk about. Mm -hmm. When I will talk about the importance uh, of uh, uh, the region, uh, for sure I will not repeat what Eric said because he talked about international importance. I will talk about the regional importance, how it is important to the regional actors. Mm -hmm. And if you agreed with me, what I mentioned in the very, very beginning, when I said that it's now really the true thing that is reformulating the regional order, it's not only for the Middle East, but also for the other regions around, including the East Mediterranean, including Sahel and Sahara, including uh, what we are talking about right now in East of Africa, uh, East of Africa. So uh, uh, if we agree on that, then I can continue the same way. Okay, so I believe that it's this geographical location is very important to all acting, uh, uh, or this, uh, what can I say, the regional actors, not only because it's connecting Red Sea, Indian Ocean, Africa, even with Europe up to North and West, but it's also for them because it's full a lot of wealth. It has its huge strategic location, uh, uh, and also it's something like which I call the cantonment of seaports. Not usual seaports, but on the on the main passage for all shipping, you know, for trade and commerce and even military reasons of movement, you know for all over the world. So it's very important to them if they would like to be existing in this region. Uh, and for sure, you know, this region, it has, how can I say, the global strategies, which has been issued by USA, by Russia, by China, by Europe. So I think this region is key country for them. That's why if I'm regional actors, I would like to meet their strategies. So I think this will be 
the good location to meet them. Uh, maritime strategic positioning, especially for Djibouti, as we know, it's full of military bases. And I, I heard one time when I was uh, visiting, I was working in the United States Central Command in Tampa, but I was visiting my officers uh, in the, what we call it, Ad Advanced Command in Djibouti. So they told me that Djibouti is very happy and one of the income of the country and the good relations and their gravity, center of gravity of the country that it's really located, located here, full of the military bases of strong powers and regional powers as well. And for sure, it's good for investment and has a lot of wealth. So we will not talk much about that. And then I will go directly how I see the main goals for each country of the actors. And forgive me, the, I will talk about, uh, 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 I think, eight countries. So I will try to be brief, as I mentioned. So I think for Israel, that also is important. It's like blocked area, you know, uh, I mean, when you come from the Red Sea, and I was working as liaison officer with Israeli Defense Force in Taba in 1994, 1995. So I remember I was, how much it was really important to them, and they would like to enlarge their international navigation to Iran. And that's why it was important. It's, it's still important to them. And, uh, you know, as Israel, I would like to see my competitors, and I would like to find them. In, in this region, because Iran is a main competitor to Israel, as we, as you know, it's even enemy. And you know the maritime trade traffic, as I told you, for them it's coming to the Mediterranean Sea. Why not elect like to find some way to go to the Mediterranean Sea as well, not only Suez Canal? So it could be somehow competitor to Egypt in this issue. Iran, uh, uh, you know, this is Bab al Mandab. It's very important to them because it's not only Hormuz. Iran would, I mentioned before in my lectures, even with Yusuf Yuchi, when I was saying that it needs two main bridges, one of them to Bab el Mandab, which is the Red Sea, the other one is to the Mediterranean. The first one is through Yemen, the other one is through Syria and Lebanon. Turkey, you know, influence is very important, same like Iran and Israel, but its influence is more because Turkey, I think it's thinking more than regional, more than other, it's thinking international. Turkey would like to be international power, really great power. They work on this way. Yes, yeah, some obstacles meet them, but they still continue on this. Remember, they have a military base in Qatar, military base in Somalia. They think about military base, not in Sawakim, but maybe in Port Sudan, which is more eligible to that. They think about military base also in Libya. It's not still military base, but they are on a step for that and maybe in South Africa as well. So this is more international than regional, but here, one of the key uh, areas is the Horn of Africa for, for, for sure. Mm -hmm. Ethiopia, Ethiopia knows all of that. And it has main problem now is Egypt. And they would like to be needed by all regional actors, even international actors. So they would like to say, we are the key country in this key area. Mm -hmm. We are more influential even in Somalia. And that's why they tried to build up four seaports in Djibouti. Reconciliation, or let me say peace, or coming back to, to relation with Eritrea is very important to them because they lost it after you know, taking Eritrea away uh, from Ethiopia. In Saudi Arabia, I mentioned before about strategic depth. Strategic depth, I believe, I believe it's specific area to secure my country. There is internal and external. The one of the weak external strategic depths to Saudi Arabia and other Gulf countries, but Saudi Arabia more, is the southwest, which is this region. It's very important to them because it's also the basket of the food, you know, food for their food security and other can't, other Gulf countries, but Saudi Arabia is the biggest one. So they are caring more about this issue and water even for sure. Emirates, seaports. Always I would say, if you would like to know how Emirates think, follow up with the head of the sea, seaport authority in Emirates. So whenever you find him, visit some place, good. This is the new vision. This is the new extension of thinking of Emirates strategy. And I think this is one of the main areas to expand this kind of vision. 
And you know, for sure, yeah, it's secure in the international shipping because seaports mean shipping. And remember, Sukatra, this is very small, but really very important because the water still competitor, not only to Emirates, but in as economic competitor, but security wise, again, China by USA. So it's because it was the water. And why the water? The water, you know, China is very big, you know, more than me for sure. And the West side, they need to be feeded from the water, which is West as well. So it's shorter distance to China from the West, which is the water. So the water must be under somehow control or supervision by intelligence could be in Sukhata. So here, Emirates play a very big role. Egypt, Egypt for sure, because, you know, it's not only Babel Mandel, it's not only Horn of Africa, but Suez Canal. Without Suez Canal, nothing to be done. And for Egypt, without Babel Mandel, nothing to win or nothing for movement. I give you a very small example of South Canal, how it's important, military-wise, connected even with Horn of Africa. Did anybody ask himself if there any war will happen between Turkey and Egypt? One of the reasons, no, is South Canal will be crossed to Turkey. Because if war between two countries, no, one of them is Egypt, you cannot use South Canal. So here, one of the points, by the way, and you can see now how this region is very important to Egypt as well. And that's why Egypt tried to find some ways, has good in South Sudan, it's increasing, you know, the relations now after what's going on this new regional, regional order was good with Sudan against Ethiopia, but it needs more, uh, you know, even within the overlooking countries, which is headed by Saudi Arabia and the Horn of Africa on the Red Sea, I'm sorry. Qatar, Qatar, you know, it's really, really locked for this last three years, I think, but in the same time, it would like to find a, a, a place for competition and influence. And dividing this crack, the split in the Gulf, really increase more competition everywhere, including this region. So if I see now, as I'm, <coughs> I'm showing here, how, how, how is the relations? You know, you find we, we have these three regional powers and we have five countries which I mentioned. Uh, uh, we have Israel, Turkey, and Iran, yes. And we know now the relation among them, it's really, how can I say, very clever and tactful relations, I can say now. And really we need to talk about it more, especially Iran and Turkey, but Israel in the middle, very important here. If I come to uh, uh, the others, Qatar is a lonely country, has very good relation with the three regional powers. Egypt, uh, 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 Emirates, Saudi Arabia, and Ethiopia, if I say it's actor, they are not, okay, they don't have good relation with each of them. So this is good for Qatar and good to have good relations even with, with Ethiopia, and especially in, in Somalia. These are the hobbits I can see. And I think there are more because really I did it very quickly, but I can say, see, Somaliland, Somaliland, always I say, I have been asked before, why Somalia to be divided? Why Yemen to be divided? I think one of them, Horn of Africa, one of them, the entrance of the Red Sea and Gulf of Eden, because uh, the government of Somalia and government of Yemen agree together on one thing, so it will be against one of the two competitors. Uh, they agree to have, they are together, for example, for example, let me say, when it was Qatar and others, so it was Qatar, so it will be against Egypt and its competitor, and vice versa. So that's why governments there must be, you know, at fine start. And, and also, you know, this kind of dividing, it increases the part of influence because I cannot be in Somalia, Turkish bases over there. So I have to find another way, just maybe with, it's not new dividing, right, by the way, but we can exploit it somehow with our, allies, I say, Egypt, Emirates, Saudi Arabia, and so on. So this is how I see the Valerie, and very quick again, I can say that I, I, I divided in three, three main, as uh, uh, I, I'm showing right now, which is uh, uh, economic, political, military, and information environment. So mainly, I can see really 
Israel was thinking how to increase our technology, how to increase our technology, because our areas of interest, they need technology, especially in agriculture, food, remember drought in Somalia, which maybe can come to Ethiopia somehow, even they have a lot of uh, rains right now, but you know, this is changing climate, we don't know. North of Africa as well, changing climate will do a lot. So Israel was thinking in this way. And the high, high technology in agriculture, as I mentioned, and Netanyahu in Ethiopia declared that. In Iran, as I mentioned, they need a place for influence. Turkey is the same, but and especially in Ethiopia and Somalia, they need them because they are against their competitors. Military-wise, we find training by Israel, we find army sale by Israel. Also, we find, you know, this uh, pro, uh, Bukharic of army sales by Iran and uh, Brooks in Yemen and this participation in anti piracy. But by the way, uh, Iran is, I'm sorry, what I mentioned here is something like it was a part of piracy and they have some had some connection with Mujahideen, which is again is to the other side, which they are fighting always political Islam or armed Islam, which most of them proscribe terrorists. So, uh, and we can find that Turkey, as I mentioned, that the military base in Somalia. And information, by the way, many agencies, humanitarian, uh, media, news, multi uh, uh, language, you know, media from uh, 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 Turkey and uh, even Iran, Israel. And by the way, even Egypt now produced something in Amharian to, to do and, uh, you know, to talk. Amharian, which is the language of Ethiopia, if you know that. So uh, I, I put Qatar in one side, and KSA, Egypt on the other side. But, you know, as I said, strategy of seaports led by UAE is one of the big part of economic influence, which also supports security and military influence, as I mentioned, even not only within Yemen, but also to have uh, uh, some of kind of, you know, uh, sensors for spionage, uh, uh, specific military base, uh, we can say in Asab, and maybe they try in Djibouti, as I said, uh, Egypt, Egypt is trying to participate in that, uh, funded be, maybe by other allied countries like Emirates or Saudi Arabia. Uh, but as I told you for info, so Al Jazeera is doing a big job English and French, and, and but I didn't mean, I didn't mention here it's Egypt as I said in Amharian language, and we can find Saudi Arabian Emirates. They produce some channels in other language. Sometimes we don't know that they belong to them, but they are also here. I mean, in this region. Final remarks. Let me tell you, if we believe that along with the three major powers, okay, which is USA, Russia, and China. We have Israel, Turkey, and Iran. They would like to, as I said, formulate the regional order of this region. But Egypt is also there. Uh, when it comes with KSA, UAE, and Qatar. But what is the problem here? As I said before in the beginning that the games or rules of the games depend mostly more big powers and regional powers. So when it comes with other actors. So it leads to something which you call it, it creates a lot of rivalry, more complicated competitions among different levels of, of actors, international, regional, regional, and acting states or Arab states as well. Not only that, but this crack, is this crack, I'm sorry, this crack in the Gulf and the Arab League which is which represented by these four Arab countries now in this region in influence competition, I think it created another level of regional rivalry. This created what I can call it lack of management of influence. Because when it was managed by superpowers or major powers and by regional powers, which are regular regional powers, Israel, Iran, and Turkey. And then when it comes to this level, so it will be lack of management of influence according to the rules of the games which are used to be followed. And this lack of management of influence really make threats 
to the regional security and increase in stability of the region, of this region. And that's why China is a big loser in this case, because they are not trained, they are not practiced to deal with this kind of even regular influence, military or political. So what about chaos of influence? Very, very, very difficult for them. This is a big trouble. It's, it, we believe it's not good, but maybe it's very bad to China as well to, I mean, to continue. Sorry. Uh, Turkey is a very strong player. This is one of the main conclusion I would like to, to say, and I mentioned before, Turkey really international player. They have big issue to do, but I would like to say something. This is like a message to NATO. Turkey is a member in NATO. Turkey tried before to be a member of European Union. But do you really agree as NATO that Turkey to enlarge its power like this, to exploit it? Or it will be headed for you as Turkey continued it on its own policy and maybe becomes like competitor or enemy somehow on the Russian side. So this enlarging of the Turkish capability, if, if really you think you will continue with Turkey, good. But if you believe with a grand strategy that Turkey will be somehow a part, so it will be big disaster to the Western side. This is all from my side, and thank you so much. Thank you, Said. And um, there are um, multiple influences exerted from within the region uh, or, or neighboring region and internationally. And uh, Eric, um, one of the one of the points um, side uh, emphasized is the, the lack of influence management and particularly Turkey's outstanding role. And you know, obviously, Turkey is part of NATO, you know, allies. And uh, um, Eric, you are. I, I, in my understanding, you are coordinating NATO's, you know, activity in, in the Gulf region. <laughs> you know, so what is your comment? Uh, first uh, response to Dr. Sai's presentation. Ah, uh, firstly, to say it was a very uh, good presentation with a lot of points and on. Um, um, I, I would like to just to address uh, a, a few extra points. Um, firstly, um, it's a very complicated region, I would say. Um, normally, it, it, it has to be very easy because uh, it's only about for the major power, for example, about initially about interest, about the Red Sea, not about the countries uh, aside. Um, the country aside are more deserved to uh, and deserve high priority. I would like to, to, to mention that so when you are uh, speaking about uh, the three major powers, and you are speaking about uh, like this regional power, like uh, Israel, Turkey, um, uh, and, and so on, and Iran. You cannot uh, understand what's happening in, uh, in the region if you are not looking what's happening in the Arabian Persian Gulf. If you don't look at Syria. If you don't look at East Eastern Mediterranean, if you don't look at Libya, all are interconnected. So if you are just looking to the Red Sea, you will finally find, like I did, just okay, there are these uh, economical interests, the waterways and so on, but you will not understand why each country is competing each other. It's very important to know. If you see, for example, Russia and Turkey, Russia and Turkey, uh, the relationship is very, very strange because, of course, Russia needs Turkey, for example, to, to get escape to uh, the Mediterranean because you have the Black Sea and uh, you have a strait, the Strait of Dardanelles, it's in the end of uh, and Bosphorus, it's in the end of Turkey. So they needed to be uh, together. But if you see in Syria, now the climate between uh, uh, Russia and Turkey, it's not it's deteriorating. And you have also Libya, Libya, when the 
because Turkey and Russia are just at the opposite side. So you, you see, it's very, very complicated. Um, about the lack of influence management, I totally agree uh, about it because um, there is, I will not say that there is no, uh, no uh, long-term vision. It's because the, the region, it's not the main priority. Like I mentioned, the main priority are outside the region. So it's just a tool. And secondly, it's about politician. Uh, we, we used to say that the uh, politics are dealing with regime, diplomats are dealing with nation and countries, uh, if you understand what I mean. So the problem that the dessert, that they are not competing, taking into account population, nation, needs, they are just dealing with regime and the regime can change. And so it's why it's not about, uh, it's not a long-term management uh, because they are not understanding sometimes what uh, Mark said about history, about culture, about uh, anything like that. It's just on the short-term uh, uh, short uh, um, vision. Uh, but I would like also to mention uh, about uh, what's happening in the big region. So now we, we, we have a turn. Uh, we mentioned uh, regularly about uh, the Trump administration and its way of doing business in the region. And now we have Biden, Biden administration. And we have, uh, this is some, uh, uh, we are still in need to, 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 know, to, to know what will be the future with uh, the Biden administration, what they will be able to achieve, what will be the guidelines, because it, it will have a, a big uh, impact on the relationship with Russia and China, of course, but also with Turkey. Turkey about uh, the uh, the NATO, about the NATO this problem, because uh, as you know, um, Turkey was partner for buying the F-35 uh, fighter jets, and now it's uh, a little cancelled because uh, Turkey both also the S-400 uh, air defense system from Russia. And so it's not compatible. But what is very good now is uh, that even inside uh, uh, NATO, we had to serve uh, uh, a very uh, big issue between uh, Greece and Turkey. And they are speaking again together. They are starting uh, from uh, this last week. The people are st speaking again. So it's maybe in uh, uh, resolving this uh, 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 we, we don't know this also this what will be uh, the uh, the way to address the problem with Iran. Uh, Iran is also this a big, uh, a big player in the region, but we don't know this how the US will address the problem of TCPOA. We, we address about, oh, is it uh, just uh, getting back to uh, the former TCPOA? No, it's not more possible. So we discussed with uh, Dr. Syed about that because uh, the situation, it's not the one uh, which prevailed in 2015. It's not the one uh, which prevailed in 2018. It's totally different. So getting back to the normal GCPOA, no, no way. It will be GCPOA 2.0 with some influence from other partners of the region. Uh, but Saudi, Saudi, it's a regional power. Uh, but how, how will be the relationship in MBS and Biden, because you have the war in Yemen, you have also uh, everything about uh, human rights. Um, it was told that uh, um, Israel offered to uh, uh, to Saudi, to uh, um, to UAE, um, to to deal to make a, this, uh, some interface with uh, Biden to decrease the pressure about human rights. In the country. It will work or not? I don't know. It's, uh, it's uh, yes. It's uh, what I could say about uh, the presentation of Dr. Syed and also about uh, your question. Thank you. How about Syed? Your response to Eric or 
we, we just open so now we just open the discussion oh sorry you're you're muted but yeah it's okay so i, I think um we can i would uh, like to give opportunity to the floor now yeah yeah, yeah. we have yes um remaining 15 minutes and uh, um anyone um just raise your um blue hand or um, I, I think he hand. said that it will finish 12 20. Ah, yes, yes. It, uh, this time uh, we have, you know, I mean, two, yeah, two yeah, yeah. 20 so, more minutes, I think. Yeah, it, 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 20 minutes extension. That's why we, yeah, we took okay. <laughs> Yes, so we have, you know, just, just but there's still um, 35 or so. So, anyone, um, they, uh, do you have any questions? Um, uh, I try to see it. Um, okay. And also, we have convened a um, number of scholars uh, in our um, on our institute, and our, we have recently set up um, research, you know, virtual kind of virtual think tank within the University of Tokyo. It wrote our cast um, open laboratory for for emerging strategies, and in this roads, um, you you you, saw, you may have saw some logo blue logo in, in each presentations uh, um but um so our, there are some scholars are working on uh, gulf regions and the middle east uh, who is participating in this framework uh, roads uh, in, in this seminar so uh, for, for example um how about Sa dr saito uh, can, can you hear me um dr saito is working on yes yes Yes, Gulf okay. issues. So you may have, yeah, of definitely you have, you've been interested in recent normalization between, you know, uh, um, Israel oh, yeah. countries and also uh, some, you know, for, for, for our understanding, it's a, a little bit um, strange is that uh, like Gulf countries are so involved in, in across the Arabian Peninsula and across the Red Sea into, you know, uh, um, uh, read the mm -hmm. region, Horn of Africa. Um, so you, you you may have some comments, yeah. questions. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, one, uh, uh, thank you for uh, excellent uh, presentation. Uh, the my uh, comment and uh, question uh, about the food security policy of the GCC countries in mm -hmm. the Horn Africa. Yeah. Uh, some some GCC countries are uh, importing a lot of food from neighbor, neighboring uh, Arab countries mm -hmm. and uh, African countries to uh, make up for their own uh, food shortage. Mm -hmm. uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE are trying to acquire the large area of mm -hmm. farmland uh, in the uh, surrounding countries of the Horn Africa, Horn mm -hmm. of Africa. Uh, especially Sudan, uh, mm. Egypt, uh, Ethiopia, and Kenya to produce uh, agricultural product mm. uh, to GCC countries. Uh, however, food uh, export from the African countries to GCC countries uh, have not increased mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, as much as uh, initially uh, expected. Mm. Uh, my question is uh, whether the uh, uh, strengthening uh, of uh, relations between the GCC mm -hmm. countries and the African mm -hmm. countries through uh, agricultural investments investment uh, is purely for uh, their food security uh, food security uh, uh, purpose or uh, or for the GCC countries to provide uh, financial assistance. Mm -hmm. uh, to African countries, I I don't I don't have the appreciate uh, uh, answer uh, as I am uh, mm -hmm. an economist. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to hear uh, your opinion from the point of view uh, of uh, international relations relations and African studies. Yeah, there's been much talk about you know next conflict would be about water and in the way. Uh, Gulf countries oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, are um, yeah. importing water from across the 
uh, region. But yeah, yeah. Um, the, the strange thing is uh, actually that that increase of, of food import have, have, have not, not yet happened. And this, what's the purpose? You know, is it assistance or you know, buying influence or buying food? <laughs> is there any, any you know, comments or response answers from our respected speakers? And yeah, well, I'm, I'm, sure I'm, me, uh, I might uh, bring some, some information about that. <laughs> Definitely the, the huge investments by uh, CCG countries, especially the United Emirates and Saudi Arabia into Sudan or into Ethiopia. Uh, but up to now, as far as I see, uh, these, um, these investments have uh, mainly focused on, uh, on fodder, for instance, mm -hmm. fodder for the, for the cows that are, that uh, look at uh, Qatar. I mean, Qatar was self-sufficient during the embargo mm -hmm. because it had uh, imported cows mm -hmm. in order to feed its own population. And these cows were needing fodder. So this is the kind of uh, investment that are made uh, nowadays, not only by GCC countries, but also other countries in, in Sudan along the Nile Valley. Um, because the land is given to them for, for long lease, uh, about 50 years or so, and uh, the water is free, but it raises a number of problems. First of all, the, the local population is uh, somehow kicked out of its uh, own land in order to accommodate these investments. The, the water is taken from the share of Sudan, or maybe also uh, from from Egypt, from the from the overall uh, disponibility availability of water along the Nile, and then uh, the the return for these investments are not really seen neither in Ethiopia nor in uh, Sudan. Ethiopian uh, being a special case because it's all also cultivates flowers mm -hmm. that are uh, flown every day to Europe. I mean, most flowers that are bought in the shops in Europe uh, come from Ethiopia. And this is through Israeli investments mainly, but also other foreign investments in Ethiopia on the highlands uh, around the capital city. Mm -hmm. They are flown by plane every day. And uh, uh, it also raises uh, conflicts with the local peasants population all over this country. So the idea of say, food security is a good idea. And certainly the Gulf countries need to have this food security. But the, the balance between, I mean, the interest is not yet uh, properly fixed, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, the local government, they face uh, an opposition from their own peasantry against this investment. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and Dr. Said, do you have any? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much. Yeah. Dr. Said, do you have any? Comment. Oh, you, you're muted. You're muted. It's okay. No, it's okay. No, no, no. I'm, I'm fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, I was just urging Mark because I think, as I thought, he has very good knowledge about that. Mm. Okay. So, do you have? Um, is there any questions from the floor? Um, I, um, one of my, you know, question to all of you, or particularly side is. Uh, you, you have mentioned the importance of, of Turkish involvement, and uh, but still, it's not you know clear. You know, uh, of, of course, central government of Somalia is helped, supported by by Turkish military. You know, no no, no one else can do it. <laughs> and, but um, for example, in Sudan, how Turkey can exert influences. To Sudan, in, you know, there's a you know issue with Sawaki Island, but uh, is there any you know strategic um, you know meaning uh, you know in, in you know getting the, the right to use uh, Sawaki Island? We are not you know it's not clear right now. So so from from your point of view for uh, Said or maybe Eric, uh, your you know, defense security point of view, is, is there any security you know, usability of this, of this uh, Sawakin Iran issue? Okay, let us first tell you two things. Number one, big difference between what I announced and what I have 
hidden and we analyze, right? Mm -hmm. Second difference between tool and goal. Mm -hmm. Okay, how? What's announced when Sawakin has been visited mm -hmm. by Turkish president, yeah. by military, big military officers from mm -hmm. Turkey mm -hmm. and Qatar, mm -hmm. of staff, you know? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and also Minister of Foreign Affairs mm -hmm. for both countries. Mm -hmm. This gives you two dimensions, political and military, mainly. Mm -hmm. But what announced it that we are in Sawakin to restore the history mm -hmm. of yeah. relations between Turkey, which is right. That's mm -hmm. not bad. And mm -hmm. here comes what I told you, the difference between tool and goal. Mm -hmm. It shows that the goal, uh, which is friendly issue that, you know, it's historical civilization of the empire, mm -hmm. and, and maybe it could be seen by the other side, which is Egyptian side and the other competitors, mm -hmm. that Ottoman Empire goal, no. It's mm -hmm. Ottoman Empire tool, mm -hmm. culture yeah. tool. He, yeah. No, he, he doesn't want Ottoman Empire, I don't think. He doesn't have mm -hmm. even the capability. It's not workable anymore. Otherwise, it will make big distance between Europe and him, which mm -hmm. he is really losing day by day. Mm -hmm. But it's only tool, maybe for internal issue, maybe for Islamic party, which he is leading people like to hear these kind of mottos. So, but why Sawakin? Why Sawakin for what is announced? Mm -hmm. But on security wise or security reason, it's maybe why not military basis to continue my series, my chain? Why here? It's the Red Sea. Mm. I have a control in straight uh, I mean, in, in uh, Arabian Gulf, I have a control and entrance, sub, you know, sharing the control, let me say, sharing the observation with my military base in Somalia, in the Horn of Africa, in Mabel Mandab, and now I'm in the Red Sea. Hmm. If you see this position in the map, you will find that it's hitting from the West, hmm. one of the main three pillars of Saudi Arabia, pillars hmm. of strength, hmm. which is religious pillar, hmm. right, which is Mecca and Medina. It's 250 kilometers. I'm talking about Port Sudan. Sawakin is about 300. I worked in Halai and Shalati when I was captain, and I know this area very well. So it's about 200, uh, uh, up to 300 something kilometers from the Egyptian borders. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> so it's, I'm here. Mm -hmm. It's not only that, but it's more international. Mm -hmm. Remember, interest, as I mentioned, as Eric mentioned, even Mark. So interest, this is the language which is really could understood by big major powers. Mm -hmm. It's the fact I'm on the ground here. I'm on the ground in Libya. Mm -hmm. And here is the Red Sea is the main passage of your navigation, trade navigation, oil navigation, military navigation, all of this kind of movement. Mm -hmm. So I think he is thinking this way. That's why Erdogan as a personality, Really, he is very interesting to me. Mm -hmm. Why? He, his personality affected his policies. Mm -hmm. He's a person, I think, my analysis, he's a person who would like always to say, I want you to need me. Mm -hmm. I, want, I would like to be in a position, all nations to need my country. Mm -hmm. I can build up my nation not with mottos. Mm -hmm. I can build up my nation with economy, with technology, with all true dimensions of national powers. And then in security and military power, I'm here and political power as well. Diplomatic power of Turkey is more offensive, is more like supremacy upper hand, mm -hmm. and he is using this way. I think so. Mm -hmm. How about other, Eric? How about your opinion? How Turkish um, influence is exerted in this region, particularly in Sudan? Um, uh, yes, uh, I, I definitely subscribe to the point of view of uh, Dr. Sayed it's about mm -hmm. the way uh, this, uh, Turkey it's, uh, uh, it's doing. So the, the only comment I, I can say that it's, uh, for Turkey now, it is uh, Turkey, firstly, yes, the Red Sea, it's also from uh, this military vital importance. It's like, it's like uh, Russia, way. This, uh, this escape also uh, the Mediterranean. Uh, the, the only thing for Turkey, it's, uh, it becomes a little overstretched. Uh, 
you know, uh, it's a lot of things to do at the same time when you will, you, you face a decision by economical uh, difficulties in your own country. You you, you have a Syria, you have the uh, the uh, high color market issue, you have uh, the uh, uh, the Libya and so on. So it means that it's, uh, um, of course uh, Turkey needs the help of uh, Qatar to, uh, to go further. They need uh, the finance of Qatar. And uh, about the localization, of course, um, because uh, even if we have observed uh, some polls uh, and so on, uh, Turkey is at odds with localization. Uh, yes, it is uh, just in front of uh, Saudi. And, and so it's a different, different advantage to be there. To see. Mm -hmm. Mark, well, if I may add a small comment. First of all, of course, uh, uh, Turkey and, and Qatar have been uh, expelled from uh, Suakin, and this project is dead. Uh, that was the price to pay for getting uh, Saudi and the uh, UAE uh, mm -hmm. financial aid for the new regime. Uh, but at the same time, I think there was a symbolic um, dimension mm. to this uh, return to Sawakin by the Turks that was that Sawakin was the port of embarkment of the pilgrims coming from all over the Sahel mm. to, uh, to go to Mecca. And uh, this raises a sound for the people in Western Africa. Mm. Sawakin means something. Oh. So uh, I agree that uh, I don't think that Erdogan is uh, going to reshape or rebuild the Ottoman Empire, but he uses mm. this uh, memory of the Ottoman Empire, which is not un, un, entirely negative mm. in uh, in Africa mm. or mm. in the Red Sea. Mm. He uses for his own purpose, which is to contest the the supremacy of the Saudis over the Mecca and Medina. Uh, this is also something very obvious, and that that may raise some um, some agreement in some parts of the Muslim communities all, all mm -hmm. over the world, because Saudis have uh, won the sacred uh, mm -hmm. sites by, by war in uh, 1924. Mm -hmm. So their legitimacy to, to run the Hejaz mm -hmm. may be contested by Erdogan, um, mm -hmm. and uh, it might uh, evoke some sound in Iran and in other countries, in far faraway countries also uh, within the Islam, uh, Islamic world. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, do you have any other question? Uh, anytime you, you you write it down to chat box or um, or you write a hand in, in, in blue, blue in your oh, 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 okay. Dr. Kobayashi, Amane Kobayashi, our site. Do you remember? Oh, okay. Do you remember? Of course. Uh, from um, JIME. Uh, um, so, uh, he's working on Libya and the other um, issues. And so, uh, uh, Dr. Kobayashi, so please. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, great uh, discussion and presentation. Uh, I have a question each for Dr. Syed and uh, Mr. Michels. Mm. Uh, the question for Dr. Syed is that uh, how what what could be the future scenario in the region, and particularly in uh, after three or five years? So, would you see the balance of power in the region while the tension is heightened by the among the regional countries, or uh, would you expect any uh, so-called uh, hegemonic stability? If so, uh, which which country would obtain the uh, hegemony? And uh, maybe the third scenario could be the in uh, conflicts or in your uh, uh, armed crashes. So I would like to know your uh, future prospects. And uh, the question for uh, Mr. Michels is that uh, in uh, December of 2019, uh, Iran, China, and Russia have conducted a so, uh, joint naval exercise in the uh, uh, Arabian Sea. So, uh, 
Would you expect that could be repeated or it was just uh, once, one time events? So um, also I would like to know how uh, the European uh, Security or Strategic Community is uh, seeing that, uh, that event. Uh, that's all, thank you very much. Thank you. Um... Dr. Said? Okay. Yeah, very good question. By the way, just I would like to mention that when I met uh, Amani first time, I knew he's the youngest doctor, I mean, qualified, specialized in North of Africa. Yeah. And I think, I think still the youngest, maybe. So uh, nice to meet you again. Okay, a very good question. Why? Because really, this is the, the main question right now, not only in Horn of Africa and Red Sea, but also all over the regions, and even, even globally. So what I can say that, yes, you said that all with third scenario is conflict, but I think all procedures and common strategies and strategies with new under preparation mm. are always thinking to avoid this conflict. Because as I said before, if USA fight China, so the the big winner will be Russia. So this is very important one we have to keep in mind. And remember that the tool of, comp of I mean, the tool of the enemies right now is competition, mm -hmm. impose influence. And the tool of uh, uh, even, how can I say actors, let me say, maybe conflict by usually, but usually by proxies. There is no, you know, direct conflict right now between two countries and the United Nations. I don't think so. So anyway, if I come back, this is the main game now and the main expected scenario is according to who will be more expanding in the region, especially China or United States of America. And this, based on that, we can see the regional actors, powers or actors. Why? USA is afraid of a specific issue, that China to control, uh, par, uh, this is uh, Paralee, uh, this is, uh, you know, this is what you call it, uh, the Djibouti seaport. If they could, they have a lot of projects, you know, inside, maybe Eric mentioned something like that. But anyway, if they control it, this is a really big headache to the United States, and this will be the first true expansion and more domination of, of China in this region. USA, I think, is coming with a grand strategy, which is totally different, and will be the first priority how to confront China, how to undermine China, everywhere, including, especially in Horn of Africa. And I think they will think again, they will think more and more how to do that. China is trying to come with some different ways. Okay, let me give you an example about that. In our regions, USA and Russia used to deal with non-Arab countries in Arab issues. And I give you examples. Such, uh, Suchi, Suchi conference, Turkey, Iran, and Russia. In Syria, no Arab country. GCPOA, all big heads, right? No other country, Europe was represented, but no Arab country, even any power of them, you know? So China would like to approach in other way. And I can remind you with the invitation which has been declared by Mr. Uh, Yang, uh, uh, Yi Wang, this is uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of China when he said invitation for multi-dialogue between Iran and GCC try to find some way. This is only try to different approach. We would like to say stability in a state of conflict. So the first scenario which I'm expecting that increasing of ways of domaining the region. With that, even both of them, they know the rules of the game, as I mentioned before. So we'll find the regional powers and we'll find the actors with their big money will never stop. And this because, as I mentioned, the lack of management of influence, 100% will support to increase the instability, which will really may threat the movement. 
who is the good i'm sorry the instability is always good environment of two things two things i believe yeah. number one uh, uh, uh terrorism or piracy yeah. okay instability is always you know good environment for them yeah. Yeah. number two approach of russia yeah. russia is a best player in organized chaos especially if it's organized by him or who can play in chaos very well he can confront you know the strategies that's why and it was mentioned that during our meeting Eru, remember a few days ago in abu dhabi in his embassy with other diplomats we mentioned something that you know very well how much china and russia came very closer in the region so i think china will get closer more to russia why because Russia is the best player in chaos, which are expected by everybody in this region now, even around them. And they want to, they need their, this kind of maneuverability and cleverness of dealing in chaos. But here another problem will come. I don't think it will continue much, this kind of nice relations between them with one goal against one enemy or one competitor. Let me say it's mainly United States, it was mainly United States, and it was before Europe and United States, and will come back Europe and United States. But during Trump, it was mainly Trump and United States. What is the main problem when we meet both of these two good countries, China and Russia? That the difference of tools of, of influence or benefits of the region. The main tool of benefit of China is economy. The main benefit of benefit, the main benefit of Russia is uh, arm sales. Arm sales means more instability. Economy needs instability. And as I told you, this instability is big devil or big, really big enemy to, to the Chinese strategy, whatever it will come because they don't have the maneuverability and they will have to depend on Russia, but for some extent, because this a lot of arm sales is really against mm -hmm. Chinese approach. I hope you got my point. Thank you. And Eric, do you have? Uh, yes. And so um, about uh, uh, the implication of uh, China in uh, any uh, naval exercise in the Arabian Sea for the future, uh, what we, we have to, to know that it's, it's, uh, China is building its navy now. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, building it as, uh, aircraft carriers and uh, meaning it is. Uh, more and more, and then it's not any aircraft car. Um, so it's one thing that so so if they are expanding their navy, it's to use it. One thing so you, you are not uh, uh, building it as aircraft carriers just to to keep it uh, um, ashore. It's, uh, it will be it will be used to use. Uh, where normally so China uh, has its uh, main interest in uh, the um, the Sea of China, firstly this are to the urging about going to Arabian Sea. Yes, we can expect that in the, in the near future they will do uh, some exercise because it's part also of uh, the uh, uh, Sea Belt Road. So if they wanted to uh, assure this uh, some security, they have to to show up uh, some present in the, in, in the region. If uh, you you cannot uh, just uh, say the security of the waterways will be assured by U.S. or any other country, you need to to, de to do it by yourself or to to show that you you have the capability to do it. Don't forget that in certain sort of presence of uh, the, uh, uh, the military in Djibouti, the Chinese uh, presence, it's something that is uh, totally new uh, comparing to the, the strategy of China up to now. It was the most assertive action from uh, Xi Jinping this all, the last year. So we can um, we can say, yes, if you have a naval base this, uh, in Djibouti, if you have uh, your economic interest, in, uh, in the region, in the, uh, the sea and uh, Belt Road, if you want to compete with the uh, US uh, and other international actors, 
you you have to show up no it's uh, just about your ability on the long term the question is for um, um to do an exercise alone or with partners it's a, a big question mark because it will make a, 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 a big difference is it so with uh, iran uh because iran uh, is building a china china it's a uh, it's helping uh, uh, Iran to build a new level base in Iran with some money and so on. Why not? So, yes, we have a lot of interest for China to do that. So, so it will not surprise me. I have no no idea, no uh, just a precise detail that it should, oh, it will be in uh, within the six months or so, uh, something like that. It should be. It should be if uh, China will uh, want to, to be a major player. In, in, in the region. But your second question uh, and uh, how Europe is looking uh, to, towards uh, China and uh, its. Uh, um, I would say, I have to know uh, Europe is looking, I, I said Europe, not your, your uh, particular European country. Europe, um, for if you see, we have a dessert. Uh, um, uh, a range of action, it's up to 6,000 kilometers. It's uh, the scope we have from Europe. We don't go be beyond. It's because of this, our uh, inability to, to, to project forces and so on. So up to now, when we see uh, we see uh, uh, China deploying and there are any naval assets in the, the Sea of China, it's more a, a political concern of uh, diplomatic concern and not yet to, uh, um, a little concern we have, it's, uh, and and so if uh, China is coming with uh, some forces, uh, then uh, doing some exhibition, I will call it like this in Arabian, uh, we will have a uh, look. It will be uh, something, and uh, uh, we will follow it. This, but uh, there is no huge concern. We we are more concerned about this, uh, how um, China is infiltrating this uh, Europe by this. Uh, economy by uh, the social media by finance and so on and not to support in the environment thank you very much i hope to have uh, answered your question hmm? okay um so uh, I, we have another question from um one of our um uh, our team in jihad um um his question is uh to uh, side and uh, also uh, to Michel and also to uh, Dr. Navergi. Uh, well, first question is about, um, you know, it's on in the chat box. Um, are we going to see more private military contractors activity in the region, in Red Sea, Horn Africa regions? That, that is one question. And uh, um, to Dr. Navergi, is grand, uh, is grand strategy is applicable in the region by any of the major international actors? Oh, th th those are two questions. And uh, um, so uh, actually, finally, I, I have a, a, one small question, final question from me is, uh, it's about the, the impact of recent uh, uh, GCC, you know, reconciliation, you know, uh, as side mentioned, uh, are the conflicts in the region is uh, related to the, the division within um, GCC uh, at this diversity. So uh, I even though it's uh, you, know, you know ideological division has not been solved, but uh, at least um, their their national interest is now overlapping. So they try to be united in, in the GCC. Uh, the, uh, so maybe Said, do you, do you expect any any positive result for for the the, the you know? Uh, in the conflict in the Yemen or in the conflict in, in Somalia or Somaliland, uh, do, do you have any you know um, the change uh, according to the the, the uh, reconciliation in GCC? So th that's uh, my my final question. But but uh, there are uh, there there are questions from Jihad on, on the private military company in this region. Um, What's your, what's your answer? Uh, for me, first, I can say, uh, let me answer Jihad first. 
if he means same like you know Wagner of uh, Russian as he do in Libya, for example. So I don't think that Russia has this big capability mm -hmm. to do that in the Horn of Africa. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, uh, if I understand it in other ways, which is like Brooks's, uh, Houthis and so, yeah, they will continue for sure. And as I told you, if increasing of instability, so more proxies will appear. Uh, not more proxies, I mean more activities of proxies will appear and even maybe somehow viruses. And remember, there are a lot of terrorist groups proscribed by several places, you know, in this region, especially in Somalia and Sudan. So maybe they could be more active with increasing of instability. Answering your question, let me say reconciliation could have a result in mm -hmm. two ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One, first one, a result of good, good intention. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Okay, there is no result of good intention of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. But result of win-win mm -hmm. negotiation. Mm -hmm. Because I believe that reconciliation is based on win-win. Why? I'm not again a speak consolation, remember, but I'm describing it. I'm just, just trying to describe it. So I hope the consolation was good intention even. But why I say that? When the besieging or boycotting, or as I told you, I call it boycotting, started, so 13 conditions appeared, clear points, and ahead of them, as I told, this is supporting Muslim Brotherhood, uh, not having this kind of proscribed terrorist elements inside Qatar, uh, supporting uh, stop supporting source of uh, this uh, what you call it, terrorist groups, uh, Al Jazeera stopping Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera. But when reconciliation, which has been declared, happened, nothing mentioned about any one of the conditions, and I saw it as it's just you know there are a big uh, what you call it, uh, fine, five billion dollars for Qatar Airways, and we have to stop it and also open the borders. So Qatar main goal of reconciliation to open the borders, not to stop competition. I don't think so, because they will continue, and other side will continue, because there is no unity of economic of economic growth. But remember, if you notice the Gulf Summit, what happened? I noticed some specific issues. Mm -hmm. Number one, as I told you, no any declaration of any condition of the 13 somehow. Number two, the two papers which have been declared with Al Ola uh, announcement or the result, mm -hmm. nothing mentioned about the reconciliation. Mm -hmm. I don't know which paper okay. big people signed. I don't know, really, I didn't see. Mm -hmm. So this only the two have been signed maybe or other one. Set third. Third, one of the points have been mentioned by King Solomon, uh, Salman, I'm sorry, by King Salman. He said, this is a time to go back to the unity. Unity, remember, GCC is not unity or union. And it's needed to be union. And union here, one leader with one goal, not only economic, but also military and political, right? This is very important, I think. It was number, if I'm not wrong, 32 and 51 yeah. or 52, something like that. Check in 30s and 50s. And you know, this is a summit result. And, and this really g give me something related to reconciliation as well. Mm -hmm. Is it a condition, a new condition to be back? Because Oman refused that, remember? Oman refused that, refused this unity. Only Emirates and KSA, mm -hmm. right? Kuwait, I don't think that they wanted. Mm -hmm. And remember, many projects were stopped, and one of them has been mentioned, the other one not, that it will be back, mm -hmm. which is the railways among mm -hmm. the countries. Yeah. But the, the bank was not mentioned. You know, this is the one money, one currency, mm -hmm. one central bank of GCC, it's not mentioned. Mm -hmm. So here, the result of the reconciliation of 
Horn of Africa and the Red Sea, it will be not built on clear, nice, good intention. I don't say they are bad people, they are very good people, but it will be based on win-win, interest, no values here. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> um, Eric, uh, do you have uh, what your answer, uh, you know, response? So, so yes, I, I will first address uh, the, the fact about your uh, private contractors, uh, yeah. about the partner. And so, um, yes, um, there is a big difference between uh, using uh, uh, factions, local factions in a country, like uh, there's a tribes and so on, and it can be considered as missionaries too, that may be uh, paid, but it's not a contract you have. Uh, so we, we, we have to make a clear difference, uh, like uh, with SDG or maybe some tribes in Libya and so on. So this, this is different with from the third country, just like this we have the Wagner Group, because with Wagner Group, you have uh, a, a, a fixed contract do something and you pay for something. There is no other local interest about the nation and so on. Um, they will use, it depends on, uh, on which country. If we are looking to UAE, UAE it's a small country. We said, yes, uh, comparing to the number of um, inhabitants with a huge armed force, because it's about 40,000. Going to 10 million uh, inhabitants and inhabitants, uh, 90%. So, yes, it, it's specific. But you know, when you, you have to go outside to, 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 to work war, um, it's about sending your own troops and uh, having it, uh, the maybe uh, the side effect of having body bags and you know, it's a casualties. And you don't want to have it was a, desert, a nightmare for the the politicians here in uh, for mbz and so on in the uh, uav when they, they got a lot of casualties at the beginning of uh, uh of um uh, the war in yemen so using uh such a group yes i think that it is a, for some uh, particular countries they will use it like a desert. it seems to be the case desert, from uae in libya uh, like and so you have uh, this, uh, Turkey in uh, in Libya too, uh, so paying and uh, so this kind of things. Don't forget that the, the Wagner Group, uh, Russian group, has its uh, outside Russian uh, seats here in Abu Dhabi. It's a uh, it's uh, in UAE. They have this, uh, the main uh, the main seats and, this, uh, and so it's about to uh, thing. And so it's it's a contract with a firm to do something. And having not to do so the side effect of uh, just uh, justifying uh, any casualties. So I think that uh, they will still use, and it's depending on which country. Uh, so UAE will definitely do. I, I don't think that uh, Saudi will do, because they have uh, sir, maybe these are huge for uh, It's uh, the, the question it's, uh, for the, the first, uh, uh, first point about um, reconciliation. Uh, and uh, in DCC and uh, the impact. Yes, I, 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 I totally agree with this, what the Sir Dr. Sayed uh, told us, but it's not unity. Uh, you have still the competitions uh, amongst uh, the diff different uh, countries, like um, for the port, uh, you have a huge competition uh, between Abu Dhabi port and Dubai port world uh, inside the Emirates, but they are competing with uh, Doha also to, to establish because it's about money. Uh, so they are making competition uh, among them here in the Gulf, but outside the Gulf too, uh, it's one thing. Um, uh, reconciliation, you, you spoke about this, uh, the impact on the Yemen war, uh, about the reconciliation. Um, I don't think there's anything about this because uh, the Yemen war, it's, uh, the roots are deeper. And, and the problem is now deeper, and it's not about the DCC and so on. You, you have some uh, some conflict inside the Yemen with the uh, SDC, with uh, the, uh, the the government of uh, Hadi, with, with uh, the Houthis, and you know they established with a Riyadh agreement. They put uh, one government 
And normally it was uh, initially uh, scheduled to be uh, put in place after 30 days, initially uh, done. And it, it took it to about it is, uh, 13 months uh, to, to put it in. It's now you have uh, different factions inside the government, but they don't have any global and common goal. When you are forming a government with different parties, what main things to do is to have a, a political declaration about what to do only. Otherwise, you will have no politician inside the government and they will not solve this. Uh, about uh, uh, Saudi and the implication in, uh, in, uh, in Yemen, I have this, a, big, a big issue with this uh, the last, latest declaration of, uh, of Trump administration about declaring uh, the Houthis as terrorist group, who's making this, this group terrorist. Uh, firstly, it gave uh, some legitimacy to uh, Saudi being, because now they are fighting a terrorist group, but it will be very difficult to find, uh, uh, to negotiate a peace. It's uh, for, for example, for uh, Martin Griffith, the uh, UN uh, envoy, how can he deal now with the uh, Houthis if they are terrorists? Mm -hmm. He cannot. So I don't think that we have this, uh, a positive uh, outcome for the Yemen war uh, for the, the next years. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Oh, um, so uh, how, how about Dr. Ravarin uh, on the any possible grand strategy uh, applied by the, the major international actors? Uh, how, how what what is your response to this question? Oh, oh you, you are muted. You, would you unmute? I'm not sure. I I, I listened. I I heard the question properly. Um, is it about the capacity of the international actors? To, to intervene, it's a very broad question. I, I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so the question is, uh, you, you know, mentioning is that the uh, grand strategy, any grand strategy, but it's a, a vague, you know, word. So, uh, how do you see, you know, international actors and leverage or any vision for 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 improving the situation in, in this region? Any actor can do. Which actor is the possible, you know, uh, um, intervening force? At the international level, I, I don't see the great actors uh, to to really engage uh, mm -hmm. in the, the the solving of the problems of the of the region. Mm -hmm. uh, as as we can notice, I mean, uh, some problems like the embargo on, on Qatar has been solved by the local actors mm -hmm. now. Oh, the, the Yemeni uh, war is going to be somehow settled, but between Yemeni uh, uh, partakers, with of course the, the, the foreign actors around trying to get a benefit from this war, but definitely in both cases, there was no uh, positive result for those who get who got involved into this uh, two uh, crisis. Mm -hmm. So what I see from the international actors, for instance, uh, something that can be noticed that uh, the Chinese, mm. for instance, and not only them, but the whole uh, Far East is getting uh, less dependent of the Red Sea because of the opening of the Arctic uh, Sea Route and other um, silk roads uh, on land through, mm. uh, through trains and, uh, and, uh, and roads from China to Russia. So China and Russia, somehow they, they get involved in the area, but they have other options. They are not limited and they are opening new options. Whereas the Gulf countries themselves, they need to solve these problems because the social and economic situation in Saudi Arabia and in other countries due to the lack of employment for the youth, uh, lack of, um, of financial uh, returns mm -hmm. and uh, also the COVID uh, pandemics plays a role in the um, weakening of the economies of the area. Uh, Dubai certainly uh, also 
is uh, somehow weakened. So the whole world is uh, sees his means to intervene diminished also by the pandemics. Uh, this is a factor that has to be taken into account when one thinks of uh, deployments and uh, investments. Uh, uh, this is perhaps not the proper time now to uh, to look forward to this future. But there, are, uh, as I as I said before, Red Sea will remain important as a as a link. Um, but uh, uh, some countries are opening new links to get more less dependent mm -hmm. of the Red Sea. So this should lead all actors to take all these new factors into account and, uh, and adopt more, more positive um, views and actions towards the solving of the problems in the region. Mm -hmm. Thank you very I think much. I have a comment, uh, Satoshi, if you don't mind. Yeah, uh, I think Gihad is naive <laughs> from his question. I think he is touching a point I can add for that. Uh, yes, grand strategies could be possible, especially through Horn of Africa. Uh, you know, free and open Indo-Pacific strategy, but when it comes at Japan, but it comes at USA. I think Biden will have to do very quick things. As I mentioned before, he will put he is putting China at the main priority, or he, he will put China at the main priority. China and he will exploit some states of China, which, which, I, which I can include even Russia in that. Number one, that China strategy is based on one way, not two way. Like before Silk Road, as uh, mentioned by Mark, that Silk Road, you know, Silk Road has something also I would like to add that it was two ways. And it's mentioned everywhere, everybody read that. But also it's noticed that uh, uh, Belt and Road is one way of economy just to import, to export from China to the region. Mm -hmm. Not only all of Africa, but all over the world, but not to receive, it's not much well trade, right? And USA know that very well. And this, it, it will try to use this kind of, how can I say, weakness mm -hmm. of approach of China. Second, they know very well this is short-term honeymoon contract between China and Russia, and they are really waiting. And I think USA, India, and Japan will be appearing in this grand strategy somehow, near or later, I don't know. But remember that one of the most important tools that China is using is time. Very speedy if I compare even with USA, India, Japan, and all other around coming from East China, uh, from uh, uh, Far East or you know East Asia up to the other side of the world. So this is really exploit. So here the game will be like what? Grand strategy by USA supported by its allies, maybe could be within FOIB and some others, depending on mistakes of their opponents with the China and Russia in front of the very quick Mm -hmm. movement of the Chinese with their even short-term allies. Mm -hmm. But only another one really difference between China and their opponent and its opponents that China is building a big political infrastructure, mm -hmm. not even economic, not only economic, political, let me call it political infrastructure, which is avoiding the American mistakes. America, one of the biggest American mistakes was to deal with the region as mixed region of Middle East. No, China is doing something different. It's making a political infrastructure of Arab region. And it has very good relation with one by one and organization by organization, which is Arab League, GCC, and even some others. And I'm sure that China will try to support more Arabian and Islamic organizations to deal with, which will be like stones in front of the grand strategy of USA and its allies. Mm -hmm. It should be good advantage, but American did not get used to do that. Mm -hmm. This kind of different organization in one area of interest. Yeah. I see that's a very good point. And uh, 
okay. So now we we uh, we have already run out of time uh, as always. So we continue on this kind of discussion in, in the next you know uh, seminars and um, so. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, such a long, long discussion, and um, um, we we've been we've been concentrating on the southern part of Red Sea, and it's a part of the conflict, part of you know <laughs> division. And maybe in the future we talk about more northern part of Red Sea region in this region, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Sudan. We have much room for development and uh, I, I hope in the near future we can talk about it but for, for the moment in uh, Red Sea and uh, Horn of Africa region is still um, a lot of um, uh, disputes, a lot of uh, conflicts uh, but then um, we have a good number of, of security experts like you <laughs> so uh, we, we, we have we, we made a very good discussion uh, today. So uh, thank you very much for speakers uh, and the participants and thank you very much and uh, uh, I, we hope we see again the next seminar. Thank you very much. Uh, one, one more point please. Thank you so much Satoshi. Thank you. Thanks for my colleagues for much. joining me. Thank you. And, uh, really it's a very good opportunity. We will continue. We promise to do the, our best as usual next time and would like really if you don't mind to thank my assistant Mm -hmm. Jihad, Muhammad Amir, and yeah. Ahmad Adil, because my presentation and even sort of information which mm -hmm. really even mm -hmm. helped my colleagues, they were the main players preparing them. So mm -hmm. thank you very much again and for all attendees who attended with us. Thank you. Thank you very much.